morning, everyone. It is both a, a privilege and a joy to be with you this morning, sharing the pulpit with um, some quality speakers as well as very good friends and fellow soldiers in a battle for the kingdom of God. From others uh, scattered amongst the crowd this morning as well, I, I'd like to greet you from uh, on behalf of Grace Reformed Baptist Church on the north side of Brisbane, it is, it is our joy to be uh, sharing such a, an important time for this nation as we understand and talk a little bit about revival. So if you do have a Bible, I'd like you to open in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's where we are going to spend most of our morning. I will be reading this morning from verse 26 all the way through to verse 14. 1 Corinthians 14. I will start the reading in verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, one, uh, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for the building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or a spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you for help. We come with thanksgiving, Lord, because you are a gracious God who speaks to your people through your word. And we do come, Lord, with pleas for our own souls. The Father, the same Spirit that inspired these words, would indeed, Lord, illumine for us. Cause our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to embrace all that you have for us this morning. And throughout this conference, we pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been paying attention through the talks that have been delivered from this pulpit, by now you should know that the history of the Church of Christ is a history of revivals. Beginning from the church's inception in Acts chapter 2, throughout the following centuries and many different continents and countries, we see again and again the Spirit of God at work, saving the people of God, ushering them into the kingdom of God, so that the Christ who died for them, for them may have His reward. Now, what we need to know is that those revivals that we often talk about, they did take place mostly at church gatherings when the people of God would come together to worship. 
as the Word of God is preached, as the things that the people of God perform around the preached Word of Christ is brought before the people of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ would perform salvation, transformation, all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is also true is, is, is that where there, were, where there was revival, there also were what many call excesses. Excesses were present, I dare say, at every single revival that has ever taken place. And the truth is, excesses were present because sin was always present in revivals. But, before we actually talk a little bit about excesses, let me start with uh, some definitions. Just to make sure that we are talking about the same things. Let me tell you what I, what I don't mean about excess. What, I, what my definition of excess is not is some sort of emotionalism. Sometimes people understand excess to be a public display of emotion that has been happening around the present time when the Holy Spirit is indeed saving many and bringing conviction of sin. Now, definitions are fundamental if we are to understand Revival and excesses well. Because without our definitions properly taken care of, we start fighting the wrong enemies. Without definitions according to the Scriptures, clearly guiding our path as we seek, to, uh, as we seek revival in our nation, we are bound to fall into friendly fire. I find it very interesting. I, I, I personally like very much much of what uh, has come to be known as, as discernment ministries out there. I think they have a very useful and important place in uh, the current world we live in where there is so much that it is evil and wrong that is done in the name of Christ that needs to be called out. Having said that, sometimes I find many of those discernment ministries because they lack the proper definition of things, they end up fighting enemies that are not their enemies, or they fight it with the wrong weapons. I still remember one day when I, when I heard someone saying, and I'm not going to mention any names here, uh, Justin Peters, <coughs> but uh, I remember him saying, and I like the guy very much, don't get me wrong, uh, I remember him saying, like, saying something along the lines of like, never trust a faith healer who wears glasses. <laughs> I was like, you just nullify the ministry of the Apostle Paul to the Galatians. And I was thinking, what's going on here? Because that was precisely that Paul, Paul opens the letter to the Galatians saying, that's the reason I preach the gospel to you because of a physical ailment. And as he goes through the letter... Again and again, he describes the, the miracles that were performed in their midst because of their faith. Whilst he was sick. So, so in our zeal to defend truth, if we, are, if we lack our definitions, we end up in those places where we nullify apostolic ministry. Edwards, I find, is very helpful when it comes to this. But when it comes to the, to the first great awakening, Edwards had to spend much of his energy fighting for the, for the authenticity of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that was taking place in the United States, especially. He wrote, in particular, three particular specific books in relation to that that are very helpful and I recommend everyone sitting here to read, if you have some time, the distinguishing marks of a work of the, whole, of the Spirit of God, thoughts concerning the revival, and obviously the most famous one's treatise concerning the religious affection. But as I said, my definition is not emotionalism, and, and I love how Edwards puts it, and he goes like this, open quote, the design of this scripture is to teach us divinity, not physic and anatomy. 
If Christ had seen it needful in order to, uh, in order to the church's safety, he doubtless would have given ministers rules to judge of bodily effects and would have told them how, to, how the pulse should beat under such and such religious exercises of mind. When men should look pale and when they should shed, when they should shed tears and when they should tremble and, where, and whether or no they should ever faint or cry out or whether their body should ever be put into convulsions. If ministers thoroughly did their duty as watchmen and overseers of the state of the frame of men's souls and of their voluntary conduct according to the rules he had given them in the Bible, his church would be well provided for as to his safety in these physical matters. Our cries, faintings, and bodily effects are no certain evidence of the Spirit of God. But it could be, especially if the effect is from the display of the spiritual things in the preaching worthy of the effect. End quote. So what definition of revival am I going to work with you here this morning? This is the one that I penned. Excess in revival is anything either taught or done in the context of a great work of God promoting the revival of the souls of His people that goes beyond or directly contradicts the initial divine intentions. Now, truth is that this is a broad definition in a sense. And then all of a sudden you have this, this spectrum of things that could be classified as excesses that range from some things that are not appropriate all the way through to things that are flat out heretical and dangerous. So now I want you to draw your attention to this particular case study in the Scriptures of God because as he was mentioned to us yesterday... The only inspired account of church history is found in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, as I already mentioned, and many others have as well, we encounter many revivals. I want obviously to draw your attention to the revival that took place in Corinth. Now, according to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 18, between verses 5 to 11, where you have described the, the beginning of the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the church of Corinth, we find that this revival took place in the following manner. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the Word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled Him, He shook out His garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people." And he stayed a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. Here we have the description of the beginning of the revival that took place in the city of Corinth. As it's been said, the marks of true revival are clearly found in the text. The cross, the atonement were definitely central. We see clearly in verse 5 that Paul was testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. We see the reach of salvation, 
that many were being saved, including uh, influential people in the city like Crispus, the ruler of synagogue. Later on, through different texts in the New Testament, we hear of people like Erastus, the, the, the city treasurer. But the Bible here, in particular in verse 8, says that many, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. But he doesn't stop there. Because when the things started to get difficult for Paul, the Lord shows up in a vision and tells him, Do not stop. I am not done yet. For I have many in this city who are my people. And then Paul will stay there for a year and six months. Which for a Pauline ministry in a city is reasonably long. And what did he do? He taught the Word of God among them. And the Spirit was greatly at work, saving people. And we see that Spirit at work as well when Paul now writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, between verses 4 and 9, when he says the following words, I give thanks to my God. Always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. As Corinth experienced revival, Corinth also experienced excesses. According to the definition that I gave at the beginning of my talk, Corinth experienced false teaching from false apostles. We see that in 2 Corinthians 11. Immoral practices, sexual immorality. We see that in 1 Corinthians 5. Overall sensuality and carnality. Warren just spent some time talking about drunkenness. What he didn't spend time talking about is about people getting drunk during the Lord's Supper. Paul clearly addresses the Corinthians as carnal Christians. In Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, not as spiritual. We see the misuse of the spiritual gifts between verses 12 and 14. That's why they need so much education in that area. Corinth was definitely a, a hot spot of the work of the Holy Spirit, and it was also a hot spot of the work of the flesh. So, so the question now is how does Paul address the Corinthian excess then? Right? Especially when it comes to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of his people. What does the Apostle Paul have to say to them as well as to us this morning? That's why the title of my message is Revival in Excess. The Apostolic Case for Correction, Not Constriction. And what I want to draw your attention to are Three particular corrective principles that I found in this particular text that I've just read today to you, as well as one constrictive principle. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the first corrective principle that I find in the text, which is that the goal is the spiritual growth of the body. I see that in between verses 26 and verse 31, where we read the following, What then, brothers? 
When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. For if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Now what we do need to know is this particular section here is the culmination of a greater section in the letter. That section started in chapter 12 where Paul builds the argument for the proper use and pursuit of spiritual gifts in the church. Now at the very beginning, in chapter 12, he employs an analogy that's very used by not just Paul, but others in the New Testament. The analogy of the human body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says the following words, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. That same analogy Paul employs in his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, between verses 11 and 16. And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to measure the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that... We may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint by which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the analogy of the body, which is mentioned here in Ephesians, is also mentioned at the beginning of this section in Corinthians chapter 12. Serves as the backdrop for this particular exhortation that the Apostle Paul is putting forward. And what he wants us to know is that in revival, all content is for building up the body of Christ. That's what he means when he says, What well, then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things... Be done for building up. Not some things. Let all things. It's not a a section of the service that is designed for the building up of the people of God and everything else you might do, whatever you would like to do. All things are to be done under the power of the Spirit with the goal of the building up of the body of Christ. That happens obviously when you come together. When the church assembles. That's what verse 26 is saying to us. That's why I said revival is found most centrally in the gatherings of the local church. But when the church gathers, everything that it is performed within the building or the place or the area where the church is gathering, is to be performed for the building up of the body of Christ. To remember my, my experience in, in, in South Korea, going to the, to the Paul Young Cho Church, 
It was, very, it was a very interesting thing. Massive church. Put my headphones on as soon as I arrived and started to listen to, to, to the church service and so on. But they do something in the service I found quite interesting. In the middle of the service, they stop. The pastor does some sort of like a, of a countdown. And then at the end of the countdown... Literally everyone starts to pray, to pray in tongues together at the same time. Very like, Imagine like 15,000 people. I don't remember how many people would that be in that place. All just blasting off. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is a lot. <laughs> but what I do remember is that at the end of that, I was just like, I was like, cool, what's next? See, brothers and sisters, Paul does not give us the liberty to play with the church service. He says that let all things are to be done for the building up of the body of Christ. How does that take place then? What, what do you mean building up? What are, what are the things that I expected to be present then so that that building up happens? And then Paul explains that to us. The first thing he, he points to is that the content needs to be intelligible. That's why he says, if any speak in a tongue, let there, one, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one interpret, let each one of them keep silence in the church and speak to himself and to God. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. Now, the principle couldn't be clearer to us here. Everything that's communicated when the church gathers needs to be able to be understood by the whole church. Se eu começar a pregar assim para vocês, vocês vão começar a entender o que eu estou falando? Não vai, né? Não tem como. Some people understood what I said in the room. But what I basically said, if I started preaching like that to you guys, will you guys understand what I'm saying? There is no way, right? There is no way the content, in order to build up the body, needs to be intelligible. The content needs to be discernible. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others wait what it is said. True revivals welcome discernment. The moment you start to see people who do not want their revivals scrutinized because, you know, you were, you were asking too many questions, you were not trusting God, you were sticking your hand against the, the Lord's anointed or whatever it may be. True revivals have no problem welcoming discernment. I'm sure you've seen, you know, like those, those videos on YouTube of, of, of guys who, who go around with those, with those devices where they test diamonds. Have you seen that? Basically what they do is they, they had this little device that, that tests how genuine diamonds are, so they go around public places and they catch usually couples in, in like waiting in line or, or sitting at a restaurant and they say, can I test your diamond. And you can clearly see when the fiancé or the husband gets nervous and when he doesn't. <laughs> right? Obviously, the ones who, who, who get nervous are the ones who have lots of fears in relation to what's about to be revealed. When it comes to revival, Paul says this, Yes, let people exercise the sermon. Let people weigh in on what's being said. 
And the content has to be also profitable. That's why the, the second half of verse 31 says, so that all may learn and be encouraged. That was, that was the bulk of Paul's ministry. We just saw that. What was he doing in Corinth for 18 months? He was teaching the Word of God among them. The content has to be profitable for the soul of those who are walking with Christ or are about to start their journey with Christ Jesus. So here's the first corrective principle that Paul puts us for us here. That the goal is the spiritual growth of the body as the content is intelligible, discernible, and profitable. What is the second corrective, corrective profit, principle that Paul puts forward for us? Now, it's not only that the goal is the spiritual growth of the body, but the means... Is peace, decency, and order in the gathering. Verses 32, first half of 33, and verse 40. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Verse 40. But all things, again, remember, all things should be done decently and in order. In other words, how, do, how does one correct a revival that's, that's starting to go out of the rails because of excess? One teaches that the apostolic correction for it is one that brings peace, decency, and order in the gathering. That peace that Paul is talking about is brought by self-control. That's why he says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God's not a God of confusion, but of peace. Now, if you read your Bible, you'll find out that prophets are very weird creatures. They truly are remarkable men of God, but truly weird in many ways. You'll find prophets that sometimes perform dramatic message to the people. All of a sudden they walk into the meeting with a with a with a jar of clay and breaks to the floor. Or you find a prophet that goes and steals the belt of someone and ties himself up and starts rolling around on the floor. Now, yeah, prophets are weird. Having said that, this does not mean that prophets are out of control. Paul is very clear to say this. If someone shows up and says, Oh, sorry, I did this. It was beyond me. The Holy Spirit carried me to do this thing. I didn't know what I was doing. You can clearly say you're a liar. In the sense that the Holy Spirit does not hijack people's minds and emotions. The prophets are still very much in control of themselves when performing their ministry. And that self-control is to generate peace in the meeting, not chaos. And then you see the call to order and decency in all things in verse 40, but all things, again, should be done decently and in order. And that Harkens back to the second, the first half of verse 33, when Paul is saying that God is a God of God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. These things 
are an expression of the being of God. There are some revival meetings that you, when you walk in, it's worse than walking in into a teenager's bedroom. It's completely the opposite of understanding of what's peaceful or what's decent and what is in order. Brothers and sisters, our God is a God who established from the beginning order out of chaos. Why do you think that in His recreative Recreating work of regeneration by the power of the Holy Spirit, He would create chaos out of order. When you see chaotic revival meetings, which are weird, again, you have reason to question what's going on, but more importantly, you have the duty to bring correction. As the Apostle Paul is doing with the Corinthians. And lastly, the third corrective principle that I want to bring to your mind is that the means is not just peace and decency and order in the gathering, but the foundation is the apostolic primacy over cultural and spiritual claims. Second half of verse 33 through to verse 38. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones he has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And the first thing we see, the first battle we see that's being waged in the midst of revival in the church is the, is the cultural battle for primacy. And Paul brings this argument saying, in all the churches of the saints, this is how we behave. As the law also says, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. But the question we should be asking here is, why is this cultural battle raging in the middle of the church? Why does Paul need to address this? Now we've already seen earlier in the letter that Paul tackled that issue in somewhat from a slightly different angle. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, and then verse 16. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I wanted to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And then verse 16, If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Paul has been on a mission through the letter to the Corinthians to help them see that they belong to a new culture now. The culture of God and His people. Although it is true that previously up until that point in the environment where they practiced their religion, there was very much not just the participation, but even the leadership of women in the churches or 
pagan temples. So much so that if you wanted a particular blessing from the gods, you would, you would take your offering, you, you would go to the temple, you would, you, would, you would offer your sacrifice, you would usually sometimes sleep with a, with, a, with a male or female prostitute that was in the temple and sometimes receive some prophecies or oracles from those uh, divine prophetesses so that you know how you would live and walk. Now what Paul is saying here is, I know this is who you were and how things function for you. Let me tell you now. The culture that you are entering into is ordered in a different way. Because the culture that you are entering into is ordered according to the divine decrees of the Creator of everything. And when He created, He created as it is said, that the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. As the law also says. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of the, of the chaotic battle of revival taking place in Corinth, Paul didn't step back from cultural issues. They were infiltrating the church and shaping the church. The battle for the work of the Spirit in the people of God is the battle for the application of the precepts of God. So very much a cultural battle was being waged, but so was a spiritual battle for primacy. We see that in verse 36. Or was it from you that the Word of God came? Or are you the only ones He has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. You see, Paul is not just battling the fact that people are getting influenced from their previous walk of life and want to emulate whatever they used to be a part of inside the church of Christ, he's also battle, battling those who are claiming spiritual authority because of a specific work of the Spirit in their lives that seeks to trump the apostolic authority. And we see that prob the problem continues. We see that in 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15 when Paul described the super apostles that have infiltrated the church. He says the following words in chapter 11, starting verse 12. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is of no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond their deeds. Paul is not just waging war about the cultural battles, but he wages war in the center of revival against spiritual pride. Spiritual pride that avail themselves of the experiences that they have and, and the way in which the Spirit to work, works in their lives to undermine apostolic authority. So they need to be reminded of the primacy of the apostolic authority in the midst of the people of God. There never was and there will never be a prophet who can disagree with Paul 
or any of the other apostles or any of the other prophets. And to close, Paul offers one constrictive principle. Not corrective this one, but now constrictive. And his principle is this. Do not tone it down and do not quench the work of the Spirit in your midst. That comes clearly from verse 39 to us. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Now, hang on a minute. You just testified, Paul, of this church going crazy, doing all sorts of things. Surely you're going to press the pause button. Say, come on, guys, no, no, stop everything. Can't cancel everything. Cancel the meetings. No, let's, let, we need to, wait, wait, I'm getting there. We need to talk. We need to talk. There is no way I'm going to pour more gasoline on that fire. Right? It's already out of hand. But Paul, counterintuitively, finishes this section of 1 Corinthians 12, 2 through to 14. Emphasizing once again that Christians should continue on the path of an earnest desire to see God work in their lives. Especially in this case, that they should prophesy. He says, no, 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 I know you guys are getting it wrong, but don't tone it down. I will correct you. I will not constrict you. I will tell you what you're doing wrong and how you can do it right, but I'm not going to tell you to stop doing what you're doing right so that I can correct what you're doing wrong. There's a double command. Earnestly desire to prophesy. And then do not forbid speaking in tongues. And it begs the question, like, why would Paul ever say that to the Corinthians? They were clearly erring on the opposite side of the spectrum, weren't they? They all wanted to speak in tongues at the same time. They all wanted to do it. They talked that was the best gift ever. And Paul's like, no, come on, guys. Not quiet. Let me tell you something. Why would he ever say to them, do not forbid in speaking in tongues? Huh. My guess is that because he knows human nature. He knows that that's precisely what his, the attempts are going to be as soon as the letter reaches the place if it, that particular line was to be crossed. Okay, guys, now we're messing up on this area here. We better, we better, better stop this saying. We better, you know. He would come from a very wise member of the congregation, you know, because, you know, Paul just said everything should be done in order and decency. Therefore, we should stop this altogether. Like, so. And the Apostle Paul clearly says, do not forbid it. This is as, a, as clear of a command as any of the other apostolic commands that you find in the New Testament, brothers and sisters. This is the sword the Apostle Paul gives to the church in Corinth to address the excesses in revival. He points them to the goal, which is the spiritual growth of the body, he points them to the means, which is peace, decency, and order in the gathering. 
And he points to the foundation, which is the apostolic primacy over cultural and spiritual claims. And to close, he points to the only constrictive, constrictive, constrictive principle in the Bible. Do not tone it down and do not quench the work of the Spirit because you're getting it wrong in some areas. Correct and keep going because the Lord will be glorified in your midst if you listen to me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, your patience with us. Sometimes, Lord, we are so slow of hearing, of understanding, of applying the truth of the Scriptures. Sometimes we, we think that fighting the battles of the Lord can be fought with our own instruments and ideas. We think we know better than the Apostle Paul. Father, I pray that you would save us from our fears. Yes, Father, that there would be a heart that it is diligent to apply every single word that we see in the Scriptures to the people of God. At the same time, Lord, save us. Save us from, from placing our caring hands on things, Lord, that You clearly told us not to. Yes, Father, help us to correct. At the same time, Lord, save us from constricting the work of your Spirit in our midst. We pray those things, we pray those things in Jesus' name.